So in the second section, what I'd like to do is to really look in more detail at the differences between central and peripheral oscillators uh, using both genetic and uh, non-genetic methods of perturbing the circadian system. So one way that we have looked at this is to uh, go back and examine some of what we would call the classic mutants uh, of either period or cryptochrome, um, which are shown here for cryptochrome 1 and 2. These are loss of function or knockout mice. And in this case, what we found is that um, if you delete cry 1, the mouse still has a rhythm, but it's uh, one hour short. If you de delete cry 2, the mouse still has a rhythm, but in, in this case, it's long. Uh, and then if you delete both genes, cry 1 and cry 2, the mouse then loses its rhythm. And this is really the, um, the reason that we called cry 1 and cry 2 uh, part of the essential clock gene network. And so cry 1 and 2 uh, mice have no rhythm. They're arrhythmic. Uh, and so what we've done is to then ask, what are the effects of these mutations, such as cry 1 and cry 2, on the SCN clock and a peripheral clock. In this case, this example shows the lung. And so this is using this PERLUC imaging uh, in a wild type mouse for the SCN and for lung. <clears throat> and what you can see uh, is both tissues have very nice rhythms of per luciferase. But if we knock out either PER1 or CRY1, this leads to a strong uh, reduction in the rhythm in the lung, but has very little effect in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Uh, in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, we have to do the double knockout as we did for behavior for CRY1 and CRY2. Uh, this, of course, works in the lung as well. But in peripheral tissues, <clears throat> we see a clear difference. Um, it's not just any CRY gene that has this effect. So, for example, CRY1 leads to this loss of rhythm phenotype shown here, but CRY2 doesn't. Same is true for PER1 and PER3. So there is clearly some difference in the PER and CRY genes and some specificity in their role in the clock system. So to look into this further, we then asked, what effect do these mutations have on the single cell rhythm? So these are now single cell recordings from either fibroblasts uh, or dissociated, isolated SCN neurons. Okay. And what we find is a very interesting result, and that is that the gene mutations, CRY1 and PER1, have the same effect in a fibroblast as they do in the SCN neuron. Uh, and this is surprising because we thought before that perhaps the SCN might be different. It might be uh, more robust. And as you remember, in the previous uh, slide, I showed you that the SCN was resistant to these mutations. But that's because uh, in that experiment, the SCN itself was somewhat intact. It was in an organotypic slice where the organization of the SCN is still intact, as compared to physically dissociated SCN neurons. So here's an experiment <clears throat> um, in which the SCN uh, in a slice is compared to SCN dissociated neurons, uh, looking at the effect of the CRY2 knockout. So on the bottom are shown heat map representations of single cell recordings from SCN neurons, about 20 cells in each case. And what you can see is in CRY2 knockout SCN neurons, the cells are coherent and synchronized, as indicated by the red and blue uh, green stripes. But in dissociated SCN neurons, each of the cells can generate intact circadian rhythms, but they are no longer coupled. And so the pattern uh, becomes fragmented. In contrast, in CRY1 knockout SCN neurons, uh, 
we see that in the intact SCN, rhythms are generated and are coherent. But when we dissociate the cells, the SCN cells can no longer generate strong circadian rhythms. And at the cell autonomous level, the rhythms are disrupted. So these genetic experiments have really uncovered uh, a new role uh, for the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that is to be able to integrate the information from many cells. Uh, and so what we saw in these genetic experiments is that the CRY1 mutation could actually lead to a loss of rhythm in the cell autonomous level, which was then reflected in peripheral tissues. But in contrast, the CRY2 neurons, uh, which have intact rhythms, then uh, did not have any effect on peripheral tissues. In contrast, in suprachiasmatic nucleus tissue, we found a very interesting result where the cell autonomous defect can actually be rescued by the SCN network. Uh, interestingly, because the SCN then regulates circadian behavior, uh, we can see that at the behavioral level, uh, the CRY1 mutant is also rescued. Uh, and so I think these experiments are important for a number of reasons. One is that it shows that circadian behavior uh, is really uh, not a direct reflection of the cell autonomous oscillator information at the cell autonomous level can be transformed by the SCN network uh, to rescue that function, uh, which then in turn rescues circadian behavior. Uh, on the other hand, uh, at another level, if we're interested in the specific role of, say, CRY1 or CRY2, uh, then trying to interpret the role of CRY1 and CRY2 purely on the basis of behavior might be misleading because we see this very different uh, cell autonomous defect at the level of CRY1 and CRY2. Uh, and so if we were trying to understand the biochemical function of CRY1, then it might make more sense, for example, to study the cell autonomous clock rather than the SCN or behavioral clock. So going back to the organization of circadian rhythms, how is it that uh, rhythms are really synchronized and or orchestrated throughout the entire organism? So we know that the SCN is really still in charge. So for example, in these experiments shown on the left, uh, these are records of control mice. Uh, and then at the bottom are records of SCN lesion mice. Uh, what SCN lesion does is to disrupt the behavioral rhythm uh, and with per luck recording of peripheral tissues, we can then ask, what is the effect of SCN lesioning of the central clock on peripheral rhythms? And so shown here <coughs> are uh, per luciferase tracings from the pituitary, a peripheral oscillator. And in intact mice, the uh, pituitary gland rhythms are actually very normal. Um, in uh, either light dark cycles or in constant darkness. But when we lesion the suprachiasmatic nucleus, what we find is that peripheral tissues become desynchronized. Um, so when we compare the peripheral rhythms from different mice, we see that they have adopted different phases. Each mouse has a slightly different phase for its pituitary and other peripheral tissues. So interestingly, the SCN is not necessary for maintaining rhythms in peripheral tissues, but plays a role in synchronizing or coordinating those rhythms. So how is it that the SCN really communicates this information? Uh, so we know that light is one of the major uh, inputs to the brain and the SCN, which then controls many behaviors such as feeding and sleep-wake cycles. Uh, but recent work has also shown a very important role for nutritional cycles and signals 
uh, as well as feeding behavior, uh, particularly for uh, <clears throat> regulating peripheral tissues, uh, such as the liver. Uh, now, to really address this, um, we've gone back and examined a second environmental signal, and that is temperature. So, in almost every organism uh, living in the free world, uh, light and temperature both synchronize clocks. Uh, and temperature uh, is involved both in entrainment or synchronization of rhythms, but there's also an interesting uh, feature of rhythms called temperature compensation, and that is that the period of the rhythm is resistant to dramatic changes in temperature. So uh, the period is actually compensated against uh, temperature fluctuations. Now, mammals actually are a little bit unusual. So this is a record of a mouse. It's a very long activity record. <clears throat> and at the top, the mouse is in a constant temperature, but it's exposed to a light cycle, which synchronizes its rhythm, shown here. It goes into darkness at this point, and then at the bottom of this record, shown in the gray bar, is a temperature cycle uh, of about uh, 24 to 32 degrees centigrade. And what you can see is that this uh, temperature cycle can synchronize the rhythm transiently, but it's not very strong, so over time, the activity rhythm breaks away and free runs. So in mammals, temperature is uh, kind of a weak entraining signal for circadian rhythms at the whole organismal level. But interestingly, uh, mice, as in humans, have a very dramatic circadian body temperature rhythm. And so this is a temperature recording from a mouse over a 10-day period. Uh, and what you can see is the body temperature fluctuates from about 36 degrees centigrade at the lowest to about 38 and a half degrees centigrade at the peak each day. And so Ethan Burr asked, can this subtle change in temperature, two and a half degrees, uh, actually perturb or entrain the phase of clocks uh, in the periphery? So this is a per luck recording uh, from liver tissue samples. And at this point, they were given a temperature pulse of just two and a half degrees centigrade for six hours uh, to the liver shown in the red trace. And in the blue trace is another liver sample that uh, was handled the same but did not receive the temperature change. And what you can see is after this treatment, the liver exposed to the temperature pulse is delayed. The phase has changed. Uh, and if we do this experiment systematically, we give a temperature pulse at all times of the cycle shown on the x-axis of this graph. This is a, a graph called a phase transition curve. It plots the phase of the rhythm on the x-axis and then the new phase of the rhythm on the y-axis. Okay? So <clears throat> if you um, were to give a stimulus that had no effect, then the old phase and the new phase would be the same. Uh, and all the data points would lie on this 45 degree line uh, where the blue points are. Those are the control, handling controls. You can see that they have no effect. But temperature has a very strong resetting effect. Those data are shown in red dots. They reset at almost any time of day to a new set of phases. Okay? Uh, and these data um, have a horizontal slope, okay, a slope of zero. So this is called strong resetting. It's also called type zero resetting because the slope is zero, as opposed to type one resetting, a slope of one, which is re weak resetting. So temperature turns out to be a very strong signal to peripheral clocks, such as those found in the liver. Um, and so this is another set of experiments, in this case, uh, the pituitary gland. The blue and red dots now indicate different duration temperature pulses. The blue dots are 
one hour temperature pulses and the red dots are six hour temperature pulses as we saw before. And as we can see here, the pituitary shows strong resetting. The slope of these data are zero, okay? But surprisingly, when we look at the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the same kind of conditions, uh, those data are all type one or very weak resetting. So the SCN is resistant to temperature resetting pulses. So <clears throat> um, we then asked, can the body temperature profile in a mouse uh, act to synchronize rhythms in peripheral tissues? So this shows you the average profile uh, measured from a mouse uh, over one day. And what Ethan Burr th then did was to program this temperature profile uh, into an incubator um, and expose different peripheral tissues to these cycles. So uh, the blue cycles indicate one phase and the red cycles indicate a temperature cycle that's shifted to the opposite phase. And in these two examples shown here, these are pituitary glands that were exposed to three cycles of these temperature cycles. Uh, the red trace indicates the phase of the pituitary rhythm exposed to the red temperature cycles. And the blue trace indicates the phase of the rhythm uh, in a pituitary gland exposed to the blue temperature cycles. And what you can see is the um, two sets of pituitaries are out of phase. Uh, and they match the phase of the temperature cycle. That uh, means that the temperature cycle reset the phase uh, within three days of both the pituitary gland uh, and the lung, in this case, at the bottom. So the very subtle body temperature variation in a mouse is a very strong signal and can completely reset uh, the oscillators in different organs. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is to go back to the SCN and ask why is it that the SCN is different from a peripheral tissue? Why is it resistant to temperature? Uh, and as we saw in the case of those genetic experiments before, coupling in the SCN uh, might be an important factor. And so we can use a drug called tetrodotoxin or TTX which blocks sodium-dependent action potentials in the suprachiasmatic nucleus and can uncouple or desynchronize their neurons in the SCN. So this uh, panel on the left shows single-cell recordings of SCN neurons <clears throat> indicated in uh, blue-green heat maps, which were treated with tetrodotoxin. And what happens is at the single-cell level, those neurons start desynchronizing and when we give a temperature pulse, uh, incredibly, now the SCN becomes sensitive to temperature. So at the top shows SCN uh, slices not treated with tetrodotoxin. They're resistant. They have type 1 resetting. And at the bottom are SCN slices treated with tetrodotoxin. Just that single manipulation alone then converts the temperature sensitivity to type 0 resetting or very strong resetting, just like a peripheral tissue. So this suggests that it, it is really the coupling within the SCN that is making it more robust and more resistant to temperature resetting and also making it different from a peripheral tissue. Um, now, interestingly, the SCN has two major subdivisions. Uh, one is called the ventral lateral, or VL, and the other is called dorsal medial. Um, and you can do a very simple experiment and transect the SCN uh, to separate the dorsal and ventral regions of the nucleus, as shown here. When you culture those two uh, halves of the SCN, they both have rhythms, but incredibly, they now have strong or type 0 resetting. In contrast, if we were to cut the SCN down the midline, uh, both the right and the left SCN, of course, still have rhythms. But in this case, they remain uh, robust or resistant to temperature. So 
this very simple experiment suggests that there's a, a pathway between the ventral lateral and dorsal medial SCN that confers this kind of temperature resistance. Uh, again, suggesting that coupling is actually important within the nucleus to make it robust. <clears throat> so what is it that senses temperature? Um, and so in experiments from Uli Schibler's lab, uh, where they screened uh, different transcription factors uh, in the liver for circadian expression patterns, uh, one of the most robust transcription factors that they found was HSF1. So this is a Western blot showing um, the amount of HSF protein in the nucleus of liver cells over time of day. And what you can see is that in the daytime, there's virtually no HSF1 in the nucleus. But at night, uh, HSF1 is very abundant. So this leads to a very strong pattern of HSF1 in the nucleus of liver cells. Um, and so uh, to test whether HSF1 might be involved in temperature sensing for resetting the clock, uh, we used an inhibitor of HSF1 called KNK437. Uh, this inhibitor can very strongly block the heat shock response uh, in cells. This is the HSP72 response to temperature. In the presence of drug, this is very strongly blocked. Uh, and when we apply this inhibitor for HSF1 to different peripheral tissues, such as the lung, as a pulse for one hour, we find that it causes very strong resetting of the clock. But interestingly, the phase of that resetting curve is slightly different from what we saw with temperature. So in the gray, um, are shown the temperature pulses that we saw before for temperature increases. In light blue are shown uh, resetting curves for cool pulses, a reduction in temperature. This also shifts the clock very effectively. And interestingly, K and K and cool pulses have the same kind of effect on the clock. So this suggests that inhibition of HSF1 uh, mimics a temperature reduction. And this is consistent with the idea because temperature normally increases HSF1. Uh, a lowering of temperature would reduce HSF1, as would inhibition of HSF1. And so we think uh, that this is evidence that HSF1, uh, in part, can mediate effects of uh, both cool and warm pulses uh, in uh, resetting peripheral tissues. Now, does HSF1 mediate temperature pulses? And we can ask that question by doing a blocking experiment. We can ask, if we block the increase in HSF1 with K and K437, will this block the temperature shift? And so this is an experiment shown on the top here. The gray bar shows the effective temperature using a vehicle control, which so temperature is giving a very large reset. Uh, at this same phase, we can give the drug alone. It causes no shift at this phase. And then the third condition is the drug plus the temperature pulse. And you can see that there's no shift, showing that K and K can completely block temperature resetting. So this is very strong evidence that HSF1 uh, elevations are required for temperature resetting in peripheral tissues. Um, and we can also do this experiment in a more complex manner by testing all phases of the cycle. And that's shown in these resetting curves. Uh, and what's important to see in these curves is the gray dots show the effective temperature by itself. And then the orange and red dots show the effect of either drug or drug plus temperature, which are indistinguishable. And this shows that the drug is blocking the effect of temperature at all phases of the cycle. This is, of course, in a peripheral tissue. Uh, and then finally, interestingly, the SCN, which was resistant to temperature, is also resistant to the inhibitor of HSF1 K and K. It has a type 1 resetting curve to the drug. Uh, 
uh, further indicating uh, that this drug is working on the same pathway uh, and that the SCN coupling network uh, can interfere with not only temperature pulses but also HSF1 interference. Finally, the um, other feature of temperature uh, was this phenomenon that I mentioned before, which is called temperature compensation. Uh, and so this is an illustration of temperature compensation in the SCN and in the pituitary. Uh, if you measure the period length uh, of the rhythm, shown here, uh, at different temperatures, what we see is the period is very similar. And when we calculate the temperature coefficient, or Q10, we see that that coefficient is very close to 1. 0 0.97 in the case of pituitary, uh, and uh, 1.04 in the case of the SCN. Almost perfect temperature compensation. Um, but if we expose these tissues to the HSF1 inhibitor, KNK437, we see that the Q10s now uh, are taken out of the circadian range and become much bigger. And you can see the orange curves here are kind of slanted. Um, finally, in blue, in the SCN, uh, we can ask, what is the effect of uh, treatment with tetrodotoxin and uncoupling the network? And what we find is that the Q10 is still the same, 1.06. So, this is a very interesting difference. Temperature compensation period does not depend on the SCN network. It is a cell autonomous property, not only of SCN cells, but pituitary, peripheral tissues, and fibroblasts. But temperature resistance is a network phenomenon that's characteristic of the SCN, not peripheral tissues. Okay, so this. Um, is kind of an overall summary of our understanding of the role of temperature as a signal for resetting peripheral clocks. The suprachiasmatic nucleus generates a circadian rhythm of body temperature. Uh, this signal is propagated throughout the organism and can be used by many different peripheral clocks <coughs> Uh, and we believe that in these peripheral clocks, HSF1 is one of the signaling pathways for uh, mediating this temperature information to reset those clocks. Now, the SCN itself is resistant to this body temperature signal. And in retrospect, that kind of makes sense. If the SCN is sending out a resetting signal, then it might not be a good idea for it to be sensitive to its own resetting signal. That might cause some kind of feedback uh, problems. And so we think that that could be the reason, uh, or one of the reasons, that the SCN is really resistant to temperature. Uh, because uh, it wouldn't make sense to be paying attention to its own signal that it's trying to propagate out. So, I've tried to give you a sort of an introduction to clock genes, clock cells, and clock circuits um, in the circadian system. And I think uh, in the field of neuroscience, uh, we're really at a very exciting uh, time today because the tools of both genetics and genomics are really enabling us to understand how behavior and physiology are really regulated. Uh, and we can very easily go all the way from genes, cells, circuits to behavior uh, in the circadian system uh, where we have correspondingly at these many levels of organization clock genes, clock cells, clock circuits in the SCN which then can regulate both physiology and behavior. Uh, and it's a very exciting time because both uh, normal behavior as well as pathological conditions might be regulated by this system. So I'd like to uh, end here and acknowledge all of my uh, colleagues over the many years who contributed uh, to all of this work. Thank you very much.